from sending to you, and you spill coffee everywhere. Why did you spill the coffee? Because the guy bumped into you. No, it's because you were carrying coffee in your cup. If you were carrying tea in your cup, it would have been tea. If it was Dr. Pepper, it would have been Dr. Pepper. What's ever inside your cup is what's going to come out when you're bumped. It's not the person that bumped you. It's what you're holding. It's what you spill. Whatever you have inside you that comes out so easily. It's, I mean, when life comes along and it shakes you up, whatever's in you is going to come out. We can fake it till we make it. It's easy to do that until we get rattled. Once you get rattled, okay, everything comes out. So we ask ourselves, what's in our cup? Yeah, we played the Easter game really good, but what's in our cup? When life gets tough, what's going to spill out of us? Is it going to be joy and gratefulness and peace, humility, or is it going to be anger and bitterness and harsh words? So I just want you to think, what's in my cup? What am I filling my cup with every single day? What am I allowing to spill out? Whatever's spilling out is just what I'm carrying. So God... If it's anger and bitterness and garbage and junk that we allow to spill out, and we, 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 we blame shift to the person that bumped into us, Lord, empty us of that junk. Fill us with joy, with gratefulness, with peace, with mercy, and let that spill out onto others. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. So, here we go. All right, if uh, you did not get one of the papers, uh, the fill-in papers when you came in, I know Miss Sharon did not, because uh, I was watching, and, and I didn't get to give one to you. Did I miss you? Yeah. <laughs> did, did y'all get them over there? Here you go. Anybody else that needs them, Miss uh, Kirsten, you can handle that for me. It'd be great. All right, so I'm probably going to be getting up some. And moving around, I'm sure, a little bit. Uh, <laughs> oh, man. I... I was just like, this is, okay, no, they have to be carrying a gun in order to shoot them, Jeremy. No, what's up? What? What's your really weird question? I may or may not answer. It says a lot. Mm -hmm. Push people. Yeah, I agree. I agree. No. For pushing people? No, I don't think I don't think there's a punishment for pushing people. Uh, Oh, you're talking about that kind of stuff. I, I, that's a baffling question. Did wickedness drive someone to the Lord? I think wickedness ends up... Okay, think about this. We used to... Church used to be scared the hell out of you, right? We talked about eschatology, end times, and, 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 and the push was because you don't want to go to hell, which we found out doesn't always stick with people. But, um, but I don't know. I think God uses wickedness. If, if someone's going to be wickedness, he, wicked, he's going to use that wickedness for his glory eventually, somehow. Uh, the wealth of the wickedness is stored up for the righteous, or wealth of the wicked is stored, stored up for the righteous. So I think it'll be used. I don't think it's any worse. I think, I think hell is hell, and it's going to really stink for whoever's there. Uh, I'm not planning on finding out. But, uh, you know, I, maybe others. But, you know, um, but I, no, I think, I think God uses that. Just like people, like the whole reprobate mind thing, he's still going to use it, it, just because you have, as an individual, let's say, have denied God and walked away from his free gift, it doesn't mean if the enemy can use Christians, then God can use the wicked. Yes. Right, well, right now, I think people are realizing we cannot depend on the government for everything. What is bigger than me that I can reach to? And they're reaching for church. I mean, we're not the only record Sunday. I mean, all across the nation, churches had record attendance this last Easter. It really would. It really. I mean, there's definitely a, a push and a shift that's happening, um, and I think we do. I just still think we need to pray for our leaders, whether we agree with them or not, because I don't think we know even half of the whole story ever. They are really pushing people and lead them to. They are. They really are. So. But that's, that's always happened. The church in China, the same thing. They shut the church in China down. They made it illegal. The church grew. 
You make something a no-no, and people go to Listen, I had guys in, in the grown in the adult team challenge program. One of them was a very well-known uh, athletic coach, football coach. I don't think, other than the addiction to drugs, he had never put, he'd never, nicotine had never touched his body. Okay, that was just his, cocaine, yes, but nicotine, no. Uh, you know, it was, it was weird, but he was this health nut. That's who he was before he got addicted to stuff, and that's just kind of how addiction works. But in the program, I caught him smoking cigarettes. He hated cigarettes. It was just because it was against the rules. That was the reason he didn't break the rules. So when something's a no-no, it pushes people to it. But, but ultimately, we want people coming to the Lord because they, they feel his love, his gracious mercy, and they accept it and they grab it, right? Uh, but I guess, I guess if the wicked push him that way, as long as they have a revelation of his love, we're good. Um, all right, let's get into this real fast. This is, we're gonna, there's seven weeks of this. Uh, Timothy Laredo, I explained, he, he's the guy that wrote the outline on this. He also, is, his team did the slides. I mean, he, all of his team must not be doctors because uh, there's quite a few typos we've been trying to find on the slides. But um, he wrote a book called Speaking in Tongues. Okay, woo, imagine that. A Pentecostal guy wrote a book. It is a brilliantly written book that I would suggest for anybody that is spirit-filled or is not, believes or does not believe. Huh? Speaking in tongues is very simple. I'll get I'll get the link. I'll send the link and everything. Uh, I'll put it on the website. Uh, he, we did a lesson Wednesday night, maybe six or eight months ago, on the different reasons, like like uh, prayer. We were talking about praying in tongues, praising in tongues, speaking in tongues, a message in tongues. Uh, that's his book. Is a lot of that. He he did his doctoral thesis on all this, but. Um, he really is a brilliant guy, uh, and having a way, he explains things very well. Uh, this is a study of theology from a Pentecostal perspective. So we're, we're not going to, and I'll explain it as we get into it. Today kind of explains everything. Um, Titus 1.9, okay? Should have a slide for it. <laughs> yeah. Holding fast to the faithful, it says faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching so that he will be able to both exhort and sound doctrine and refute those who contradict. Uh, the NLT words that he must have a strong belief in the trustworthy message he was taught. Then he will be able to encourage others with wholesome teaching and show those who oppose it where they are wrong. We got to know the why behind the what. We have to know why we believe what we believe. You have to be able to... That's where This isn't apologetics, but that's kind of where apologetics comes in. Ultimately, you just need to know. So, introducing this series, what we're teaching here, uh, we're going to discover, I think we have, this should be the next slide, uh, within this series, we're going to discover the significance of building our lives upon, there it is, uh, why do we build our lives upon biblical, sound biblical theology? So, the whole purpose of the next seven weeks is to, one, strengthen your faith. I'll, I'll let you know when you have a fill-in, too. Strengthen your faith as you more deeply start to understand God's revelation to mankind. The Bible is God's revelation to mankind. It's a revelation of Him. It's His revelation of Himself, which I think is awesome, okay? So, to strengthen your faith as you start to understand God's revelation, God's Word, even more deeply than you have. Two, empower your relationship with God as you grow in your practice of these truths, and three, create unity in the church, because the church is unified when we commit to these things. We can commit to important biblical truths. I'm not talking about doctrine. I'm talking about theology, and we'll explain the difference. But so studying theology on some of these slides will show you like studying theology is, is important. It's an important part of growing in your faith, but it, because it grounds your faith. It grounds what you believe in. It grounds you in the truth, holds you in the truth. Because, and I love the line, simply because we firmly hold to a belief does not make it true. Just because you really want to believe something really bad or do doesn't make it true. So your level of belief isn't the marker of truthfulness or validity in, in, in a doctrinal idea or a biblical idea. Mature Christians desire more than that. We would desire not just firmly held beliefs, but that our beliefs are rooted in the foundation of the word, of the truth. Um... No, and I don't think doctrine ever should be based off one scripture. And I'm going to kind of show you why throughout this. So the word theology comes from two Greek words, theos meaning God and logia meaning word or words or saying. So theology meaning God and words. So 
this whole Pentecostal systematic theology type thing, we're, look, we're trying to provide a logical, organized account of biblical truths from a spirit-filled perspective, Pentecostal perspective. Why behind the what? Why do, believe, do we believe because someone told us to or because it's truth? And if someone asks you, why do you believe in the gifts? Well, I was raised in church and I saw it. Okay, well, someone that doesn't believe needs something. They're going to need more than that sometimes. Um, so seven parts are going to break down like this. Today is bibliology. Uh, next Sunday is theology proper. So study of the Bible, study of God. Uh, Christology is the study of Christ. Pneumatology is the study of the Spirit. Soterology is the study of salvation. Ecclesiology is the study of the church. And eschatology, we all know very well, the study of end times. So that's how it's going to break down. Uh, over the next seven weeks. Now, there's a guy named Dallas Willard that has a quote on here. Theology is a part of our lives. It's unavoidable. A thoughtless theology guides our lives with just as much force as a thoughtful and informed one. Let's just be, some of you are, are products of coming from a church that had very, many of you, and I'm not a church, multiple churches that had a very thoughtless theology. Whatever feels right is right. Whatever feels right right now. There's tons of them. There's tons of them out there right now. So 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is inspired by God. And it's useful to teach us what is true and what makes us realize what is wrong in our lives and corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us what to do right. So all Scripture is inspired. Your first fill in the blank is this. It says, the reason we're going to begin with the theology of the Bible, bibliology, is because what you believe about Scripture is the, two words, most essential belief. Most essential. I may have to change his slides because they're made for people that have, like, eagle eyesight. Most essential belief. Whatever you believe about Scripture is your most essential belief. I know there's groups that are all spirit, no word right now, but we've talked about that through multiple weeks. It doesn't work out. For there's no foundation. When life hits your cup... There's no foundation. Every other theological truth that you will ever hear is built on the foundation of Scripture. Notice I said theological truth. Truth is built on Scripture. So what we believe about the Bible will influence every other belief that we have. If you believe that, it's contra that it contradicts itself, it, that's going to mess up. That's going to go flow into every other belief you have. Um, if, if, if you believe that parts of it were written for another time, another place, that's going to flow into everything else. So next fill in is the Bible claims that it is a book from God, to be a book from God. It claims to be a book from God. Therefore, we either accept that or we reject that claim. Remember Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If you can't agree with that, you can't get past that verse and believe it, then it's hard to believe the rest of it. We either have to accept the first verse or not. Just like this. The book, this claim, the, the claim of the Bible is that it's a revelation from God. It is a book from God. We either accept it or reject it. If we accept it, then the divine authority of the Bible has to impact everything else that we do. Okay? If we accept the book from God, then we can't just throw it away for our feelings. Um, if we reject it, then the Bible has to be an evil book. If we reject it, then it's an evil book filled with lies and should be ignored by all mankind. Accept or reject. Second Peter 1, 20 and 21. On this one, he has, but know this, the translation said, but know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. NLT says, above all, you must realize that no prophecy in Scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding or from human initiative. Let me say that again. No prophecy in Scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding or from human initiative. No, those prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit and they spoke from God. Uh, there's a guy named J.J. Packer. We have a quote from him up here that says, when you encounter a view of Holy Scripture, you encounter more than a view of just Scripture. Whatever you meet is a total view of God and the world. That's a total theology. I want to talk to you a second about what apologetics is real fast. 
one of the greatest apologetics of our time, passed away recently, or greatest in that field, we'll just say that. Um, uh, I want to talk to you about what apologetics is and what it is not before we move forward. Apologetics, if you had to define it, it's the formal study uh, concerned with a systematic defense of the faith, of the Bible, uh, or doctrine. So apologetics doesn't mean we're apologizing for our faith. Don't get that mixed up. We're not apologizing to people for our faith. Um, it, we're actually told in the Bible to be bold, right? So, so it wouldn't make any sense to go around apologizing. The word apologetics comes from a Greek word, uh, apologia, which simply means an answer given in reply to something. So the whole word apologetics, is, it means an answer given in reply to something. So when we talk about apologetics, don't think of it like a debate, a believer and a non-believer. You're not debating one another. Um, the, the best way I can, that we can explain it is, think if you're remodeling a house or tilling a garden. That should hit everybody here who's either worked in the dirt or with sheetrock at some time, okay? You're remodeling a house or you're tilling a garden and you find a very old safe that's locked up. You believe that this safe holds an infinite um, uh, amount of treasure in it, okay? This, this wonderful treasure, you're convinced infinitely invaluable treasure is in this safe and you're telling your friend about it. Y'all go have lunch. You're telling your friend about the treasure that you think in this safe. You're going to open it up. But your friend has some questions and some doubts. Here comes apologetics. This is where apologetics comes in. It's the rational response to objections from a person who, A, never has experienced the safe before, and B, doesn't believe it holds the same valuables you do. A rational response you know what a rational response is not? Well, you're just going to go to hell then. <laughs> it's not a rational response, people. Okay? A rational response to someone who never did experience the safe that you're talking about and doesn't believe it holds the same valuables you do. That's what it is. They don't hold the same. That, that being said, um, this is not an apologetic. This study is not an apologetic of the Christian faith. We're not trying to defend the faith. Um, we're just looking at it. We're studying it from a Pentecostal perspective. Um, there is books like um, Paul Barnett uh, has a book called Is the New Testament Reliable and F.F. Bruce, The Canon of Scripture. Those are great books if you want to look at apologetics of Scripture, a defense of the faith. For this study, we're just kind of assuming that everyone in here believes in Christ, okay? And we're giving you the, the foundation. We're giving you the why behind the what. That's what we're doing, okay? Um, so none of this is us defending teaching. So origin of scripture. We're going to talk about origin of scripture. Um, you're going to have another fill-in right here. Origin of scripture. The Bible is, next word is unique. It's unique. It's the most unique book in the world. It's unique in that it was not written by one single individual or from one single time period. The Bible has around 40 authors, approximately 40 authors over 1,500 years. Now, if I take the people in this room, if I take five people in this room, and I want you to write an account of what happened last Sunday, none of them are going to match. We just, we just can't, we're not going to match. So you have the Bible written, it's unique, 40 different people over 1,500 years in different time periods. So that makes the Bible unique in its entire scope of human history. 1,500 years of human history are in the Bible. No other book holds that. You can look at the periods up there. The Old Testament period was written from about 1450 B.C. to 425 B.C. And the New Testament around 4 B.C. to 90 A.D. Give or take. So that's the origin of Scripture there. Another type of origin of Scripture we have is two types of revelation that you're going to see in Scripture. General revelation. General revelation is things that, revelation that we get from nature, uh, in your conscience, General revelation is looking up into the sky and going, wow, wow, there's no way that this just happened by chance. Look at the, look at the creativity of a bird's nest. Look at the, okay, that's general revelation. Special revelation is what we get through Christ or we get from Scripture. So we get general revelation and special revelation. So if you take the 66 books of the Bible... They make the entire Bible. They're diverse. They're so diverse, but they're still unified together. They still hold together, making one book whose ultimate author is God. Next word is originator. Next fill-in. He is the 
God is the originator of his own revelation, which I think is so cool. Therefore, God is the originator of his own revelation. And when we talk about diversity of the Bible, you have to look at the writers, the diversity of the writers that we have, various human authors, the different context, uh, historical context um, that you have. You have different time periods of Israel. You have uh, just, just the context, the historical and human context of the Bible at all shows this diversity. Then you have changes in redemptive history moving from the uh, sacrificial system to the cross. And then you have multiple different languages that it was written in. Old Testament, mostly Hebrew, mainly Hebrew, some Aramaic. New Testament, just about all of it Greek. Um, so you have it written from 40 different authors, 1,500 years, multiple different languages, different places, different times, and it all fits together. F.F. F. Bruce said this in one of those books. The Bible is not simply an anthology. There's a unity which binds the whole together. It's not one book that follows another. Follow, it, follow, it, there's a unity. There's a glue that holds the whole Bible together, and that, that glue is the inspiration of Scripture. The Bible is inspired of God. Inspiration of Scripture says that the Bible uh, claims that it, it has a divine source that we just read in 2 Timothy 3.16. If its divine source is God and it's influenced by God himself. So 2 Timothy 3.16, again, is all scripture is inspired by God. And it's useful to teach us what is true, to make us realize what is wrong with our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us what to do is right. So here we go. <laughs> There's a Greek word right there for inspired. Theonoustos. Okay? It literally means in the Greek, God breathed. God breathed scripture. As such, the scriptures are, uh, owe their entire origin to God. They're God breathed. Their origin, their distinctiveness, the glue that holds them together, they owe that to God Himself. That is the main character of scripture. That's all God breathed. Did man write as man's character in there? Yes, man's character is in there. Man's attitude comes out in there. Man's prayer comes out in there. Lord, set them on fire, roll them down the hill. Uh, <laughs> I'm running for my enemies. Yes, but it's all inspired and breathed by God. So it's called the verbal, verbal plenary inspiration. It's all these big fancy words that some of you will take on a test one day uh, and probably never use in a sermon. So the entirety of Scripture from beginning to the end is God-breathed or inspired by God. Therefore, the words themselves are influenced by God. It's like everything we we everything we we preach here on a Sunday is prayed over. It's prayed over and prayed over and worked at and looked at and made sure that it is a God breathed something. Something coming, it's God breathed message. If it's not, it comes off the pulpit, it falls dead on the floor. So just like God inspired the biblical prophets to speak, he inspired the biblical writers to write. Doesn't mean it was a mechanical and just moving their hands. He spoke to their hearts. Their hearts started to write down. That, that had to be a big calling because they didn't have copy machines, they had typewriters, and they had papyrus, no paper. So, what are the proofs of this inspiration that we're talking about? The proofs of the inspiration of Scripture. First, we have external proofs we can look at, which we'll get into over the seven weeks, uh, which are like historical documentation. There are things. Um, my kid, it liked to blow him away when I let him know we have Roman, uh, we have we have writings in cuneiform and all that from from Romans themselves about the crucifixion and about the Jews, and that there's this historical context there. We have external proofs and historical documentation, but the fact that the the whole thing sticks together, that we have uh, uh, geography and history that matches together, that that we have. If you, if you look for Jericho and you dig to the level that, if, if you listen to Christian archaeologists digging to the soil level that they date the fall of Jericho to, you'll find walls that are crumbled and towns that are things that are burned. And if you dig all around the Canaanite area, it proves the Bible because not only are the walls of Jericho destroyed, there are the, 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 the towns that God said don't touch them at that level aren't harmed at all. The towns that God said, don't take a seed from this place, 
still have seeds in, in jars and nothing was taken and that that he said burned to the ground has been burned to the ground. So we have historical proofs. Um, we have historical proofs even from Egypt that, that it's a time period thing. That's the archaeological proofs. Then we have two, the internal proofs. Jesus believed that scripture came from God. We see that throughout things that he says. Um, if you look at the prophetic accuracy from the Bible, I don't know that we've ever found a, prof a prophecy from the Bible to be false. If we did, we would have shut the whole thing down. And then you have the unity and diversity again. So Mr. Packer again says in another, Scripture should be the, thought of as God preaching. I just want you to take that in for a second. Scripture should be thought of as God preaching when you read it. God the Father preaching, God the Son and the power of the Holy Spirit. God the Father, the giver of Scripture, God the Son is the theme of Scripture, and God the Holy Spirit is the illuminator of Scripture. This should not be a boring read for you. It should be illuminated. Let the Holy Spirit illuminate it. So, and we're getting into that. We just got to get through all the technical stuff first. Next, we have these the other things here, infallibility of Scripture. Y'all ever heard that from a preacher, the infallibility of Scripture? The next fill-in, infallibility of Scripture claims the Bible is incapable of failing. Your word is failing. Scripture itself claims that the Bible is incapable of failing or being unreliable. So the infallibility of Scripture declares that, that God's word remains permanently faithful to fulfill its purpose always. The word of God never turns void. If God, and then, because if God's infallible, his word's infallible too. And vice versa, if his word's infallible, then that means he's infallible. The doctrine of Scripture's infallibility is based on an understanding of God's perfection of character. He is perfect, therefore his word is perfect. Getting an understanding of who he is, who his word is, what his word is. So um, Psalms 19.7 says God's word is perfect, refreshing the soul. Why? Because God himself is perfect, therefore his word is perfect. Um, and then we know God's closely associated with his word. In, in John 1, he calls Jesus the word. He's given that title. So the bottom there, whether you can read it or not, I don't know. The infallibility of Scripture, and I need you to get this. I need you to understand. The infallibility of Scripture does not stand on the infallibility of the preacher or the church. It's infallible because God's the author, period. Can we twist it and misuse it? Yeah, that still doesn't make it fail. It makes the, the person teaching fail. Um, Psalms 119.89, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. I have your eternal word, O Lord, stands firm in heaven. Two different translations for a reason. Isaiah 40, verse 8, on this, I don't know if I have it. Yeah, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Uh, NLT says, um, the exact, translates it the exact same way. So we have the infallibility of Scripture. Another big word you've heard is the inerrancy of Scripture. It states that the Bible, the Bible is without error. Let me explain something here. It's talking about the original manuscripts of the Bible, not your translation. When it states that it is without error, that does not mean that your King James or your ESV or your NIV is without error. It means the original manuscripts are without error. And we're going to get into that deeply tonight. So, so it claims that Scripture is accurate in all of its claims. That means doctrinally, historically, scientifically, everything. If it says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, that means in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And as far as the original manuscripts or autographs have been copied, faithfully translated, passed down, Scripture itself is inerrant in the copies as far as it's been translated. Okay? Now, there's a lot of debate now on whether your Bible is inspired or not. I'm so, I, I made a dude leave that was teaching uh, in Lafayette because the guy, some of the guys had NIVs and he, this man called it the, the nearly inspired version. 
okay? That was the last time he got to teach. That was the last moment he taught there. Actually, he said that. The last words he said other than why. Don't matter. I'm going to show you the what if you don't need to know the why. And you can go. Uh, there's a lot of that. I got to ask a question. A man that I don't know that was beaten up on somebody because they do a prison ministry in Louisiana. And uh, they had these guys that just wanted to take a picture to show the world, look at how much I've changed, look at how much we've done, you know, God's done what God's done to us. And the first comment was like, did you tell them they need to be baptized in the name of Jesus only? Which is not scriptural anyway. I mean, not doctrinally, it's not sound. And he starts beating this man up because you're lying to these men because they haven't spoken tongues yet, so they're not saved, which is also not sound. And I was ignorant enough to comment. And, and that got fun. And that's one of the first things he asked me, what kind of Bible do you read? The holy one. Inerrancy of Scripture. Basis of inerrancy. Why, why can we say the Bible is inerrant? Well, the, look at the character of God. If Scripture is God's word, then, then it has to be without error. And the character and nature of God himself inhibits his word from being anything less than his essence, which is truth. Titus 1-2 says this truth gives them confidence that they have eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised them before the world began. Basis of inerrancy, number one would be the character of God. Number two, number two would be Christ and the apostles believed that the Bible was inerrant. All throughout the gospel, Christ refers to the Old Testament as coming from God, as inspiration from God, as being God's word. The apostles quote the Old Testament writers. They trusted it to be divinely inspired as well. Let me pull up my notes here on this because I'm definitely going to need them. Uh, B.B. Warfield. Quote, plain up. We believe this doctrine of the plenary inspiration of Scripture primarily because it's the doctrine which Christ and his apostles believed, which they have taught us. And then the next one is a guy from, you may know this guy. He, t he built a town. His name's Augustine. St. Augustine built a town right down the road. St. Augustine. I actually don't know that guy. Yeah, yeah. He said, uh, it seems to me that the most disastrous consequence must, uh, it's hard to read it because like, I don't have it. Must follow upon our believing that anything false is found in the scripture. If you once admit into such high, such a high sanctuary, I can't read it. Can y'all read it from here? I should have put it in my notes. Authority of false statement, therefore, not be left a single sentence of scripture, which he is so smart. I love this dude. If appearing to anyone difficult in practice or hard to believe may not be the same, fatal rule be explained away and declared to not be true. If anything of it is not true, then the whole thing is not true. If there's one false thing, then it's all false. Now, somebody's going to ask you, what's your basis of inerrancy? Why, why can you say, you, okay, you believe Christ, you believe Christ, you believe historical. The third thing is the historical position of the church. The church has always held, every church has always held the belief throughout centuries that Scripture is without error. That means every studious man and woman of God throughout the centuries have believed the church, that, that the, that the uh, word is without error. It wasn't until about 150 years ago that it got popular to question inerrancy. It's something that became popular in the church as we started arguing doctrinal things with one another. It became popular. Let, let's question whether this is right or not. Let's build our own doctrine. Let's build our own theology. And that's where you get a lot of weirdness. The fourth thing is the foundation for all other doctrine. It, scripture is the foundation for every other um, Christ-believing doctrine that we have, whether it is Baptist, Assembly of God, whatever, Scripture, if Scripture is inaccurate, that means every other doctrine is also fully inaccurate. Fully. Your next fill-in, inerrancy doesn't claim that every translation is inerrant. Hold on to your seats because translations aren't inspired. Your word is inspired. That means my lovely NLT is not inspired. And the King James is not inspired. They may not be divinely inspired, but they're necessary. 
They're necessary for us to understand this divinely communicated truth because you can't read Greek, I don't think. And I can't read Hebrew, I know. So they're necessary for us to understand the truth, but that doesn't mean they were inspired. And I'll explain. We have to understand that the Old Testament was written mostly in Hebrew, New Testament mostly in Greek. We don't speak Hebrew and Greek today, okay? Therefore, any Bible that's written in a different language is not Hebrew or Greek. Guess what? It's a translation. Anything you have that's not Hebrew or Greek is a translation. Okay, there are three different ways they try to translate the Bible. And I'm going to break these down. You're, you have three fill-ins right here. First one is formal equivalence. Dynamic would be the second one. And paraphrase is the third. I'll, formal, I know. You look at that and your eyes go cross. Mine too. I may need a charger and extension cord for my iPad. I don't know. Uh, formal, dynamic, and paraphrase. Formal equivalence, dynamic equivalence, and paraphrase. It's okay, Elena, I got, never mind, I pulled it up on my phone. So I got it here in case. It, it finally opened up. Um, so formal equivalence, let me explain this real fast, because you look at it and your eyes go crossed, and, and formal equivalence translation is known as a literal translation of the Bible. That's what everybody wants, right? We want a literal translation of the Bible. We want a word-for-word -word translation of the Bible. That's what this is thought of as. Formal translation is a literal or word for word. The, I, the idea behind this is we're going we're gonna to be as, as, as literal to the original as possible. Um, doing our best to use the same word order and everything. So the thing with, for, yeah, if you can open this on there. Um, an example of a formal equivalence would be the ESV, the King James uh, the New King James, that's a formal equivalence Bible. Now, it's a more literal or formal translation of the original word, and it is excellent for Bible study. They're excellent for Bible study. You don't have logos? Okay. I, you know what? If you'll bring my, get my computer, I just don't want to miss a bunch of slides. So I got a long he area here that I got to talk. So, all right. There are issues with formal equivalence translation. So if you're a KJV only person, hold on. If you're an NIV person, only, only person, hold on. This may hurt a little bit. Um, formal equivalent, the, the issues with that are this. To begin with, a formal equivalence like a King James, ESV, they're not usually as readable as dynamic are, okay? Um, the, dynamic is more of a thought for thought instead of word for word. So the the... Formal translations come across very sharp or, well, wooden, or I don't know how you would say it, but they can also be misleading at times. Now, hear me out. I'm not bashing any translation here. Philippians 2.6. If you want a literal translation of Philippians 2.6, it says, Jesus was in the form of God. You're amazing. Thank you. Jesus was in the form of God. That's a literal translation of that uh, scripture, but a dynamic translation clarifies that. He's not in the form of God. Jesus is God in his very nature, is what it says. Does that mean, that's the exact meaning of the text from the original manuscripts, that he is God in his very nature, but a formal translation said he's in the form of God. Why? Because no translation is completely literal. It's not possible. It's not possible it's important that you understand that no matter which translation you hold so dearly, it is not 100% word for word from the original. It can't be. And I'll explain why it can't. Um, it's not a simple process. You can't find one English word for one Hebrew word or, or one Greek word. I mean, we, we, I love my kids and I love pizza. But in the Greek, they can explain that a whole lot better because they got different levels of love, the word love. Um, so the other thing is, Words cannot be translated by the, in isolation by themselves. It's hard to do that. Um, expressions or idioms, okay? Expressions may have held near and dear to everyone's heart uh, 2,200 years ago that we don't understand today, okay? If you, told, if you tell someone in 150 years, man, that was cool, they're not going to know what you're saying, Okay? Like, if, if we translate just weird sayings that we come up with that, that catch on, like, man, how bad was it? It was like socks on a rooster. 
What's that? I don't know. I just, it's the weirdest thing I could think of. But, but let's say we know what it is, like socks on a rooster. It'd be strange, I guess. I don't know what it means, but... But you can't... Things that were, were, were sayings or idioms when they, when they wrote the Bible, we don't necessarily understand those things today. Um, when the New Testament speaks of people being sick, let me give you an example. The literal reading from the Greek is having it badly. So he was having it bad. Today, if you got it bad for someone, it means you like them. So a literal reading of they brought the, the woman with leprosy to Jesus because she had it bad. That don't sound good. Right? So, the, so Matthew 4.24, a, a, a little bit better understanding would be, and they brought to him all the ones having it badly with various diseases. Having it badly. Um, Matthew 118 speaks of Mary being pregnant in the literal rendering. It says, having it in the stomach. Not that they were calling the Lord it. It was, it was an idiom that meant she was pregnant. Then. It doesn't mean that now. So those are just two examples of how expressions can't be translated in a way that makes their meaning understandable if we do it literally. Um, I mean, 1 Peter 1.13, this is in most of your Bible, says, gird, the lo- gird up the loins of your mind. Are there any kids in here? Last time I checked, we don't have mm-hmm, on our minds. Okay, We probably do. Wait, some of you might. Hold on. Some of you may have it on your mind. But, but what I'm trying to say is physically, I don't have any loins to gird up on my mind. What does that mean? It's an expression. It's an expression that means pay attention. So if, I, if I'm going to gird up the loins of my mind, I have no clue what that means. I would have to, and this is, this is, it means pay attention. So a dynamic, the ESV, which is formal, actually changes it to pay attention because they don't want anybody trying to gird up their brain. So, <laughs> but there are a number of translations that keep it in that manner, which is fine. Here's the thought process. When the translator says, I'm going to leave, gird up the loins of your mind, This is their belief system. Their belief system is it is up to you, the reader, to figure out what that expression means, not the translator. And that's fine. That's their way of translating, okay? Other translations take a very, very different approach, which is called dynamic equivalence or functional equivalence. This is more of a thought-for-thought translation or phrase-for-phrase. It's not literal. Uh, They attempt to translate the text in a way that, that... is phrase for phrase or thought for thought. We want the thoughts that were expressed in the original speech expressed in today's language. Um, So they're not concerned about grammar or the original form. Uh, It's a little bit easier to read sometimes, but but here's the issue. Dynamic equivalence involves rewording of stuff. Does that mean they added to God's word? No, it means they have to reword to explain expressions today. like Psalm 23, 5, the text literally reads, anointed my head with oil. Well, the Good News Bible replaced that to welcomed me as an honored guest. Why, though? Why? Because in that scripture, that's what he's trying to say. They allowed me in as honored. Okay? But it does so. The problems with dynamic, dynamic equivalence is, um, though it's more readable than a, than a formal Here's the issue with it. If the translators misunderstood the thought or the phrase that was trying to be brought across, then they pass that misunderstanding on to their readers. Okay? Does that mean the Bible you have is bad? No. No, if you have a Tyndale or what's the other big publisher? Tyndale, um, Zondervan, or you look at the publisher of your Bible, they're very careful about a lot of this. There are a lot of great translations out there. What I'm saying is the best thing to do If you're studying to share, if you're going to share, if you're going to teach, if you're going to preach, I think you have to have, you need one of each. You need a formal and a dynamic to realize. And I think you multiple, you use multiple translations to really get an understanding of the scripture. That's what they're there for. I read the NLT. My personal Bible reading is NLT because it's the one I love the most. It's one of the ones I started with. I understand it. it is a very dynamic translation, very dynamic translation. I also have King James. I, I am a Bible junkie. I have them, plus I have them in digital. Every one of us has just about every translation in digital form. You can go to just about anything, okay? So, huh? 
Greta. Oh, okay. All right, All right. That, that's fair as long as it, the message is right. Uh, so if you're in preparation to study to preach or teach, I think you ought to look at both of them. You need to look at New King James or King James. You need to look at Dynamic. Um, what, what do you read personally? Which one speaks to you the most? Which one do you understand? I know people that understand King James a lot better than they do NIV. And people that understand NIV a lot more than they do King James. But, but neither of them are inspired of God. They are translations of an inspired work. So you can't say that one's greater than the other. Now, <laughs> that being said, taking off 30% of the people here, um, what type of Bible do you read? I read a holy Bible. It's a translation of holy manuscripts, God-breathed manuscripts that have been carefully poured through by thousands of people. And translators have gone to great, great lengths to try to make sure that the message stays solid. The phrasing may be different, but the message, if the message isn't the same, the translation gets thrown away. We, this is the most tested book in the world. And any translation that comes out, people will test and they will try. And if there's something wrong with it, it'll get thrown away quickly. They go to great lengths to try to make sure that the message remains unchanged. So I want to give you, uh, is four translation myths my next slide later? No, okay. These are types of Bible translations, which are going to be hard for you to see. But we're going to go on this. This is the most word-for-word -word translations to the most paraphrased translations. So uh, over here at the end is called the interlinear Bible, or you may see the, the Young's literal translation. Even the Young's literal translation isn't literal, but then you go to the New American Standard Bible. Amplified, believe it or not, is a word-for-word -word Bible, uh, as much as it came at ESV, RSV, King James, New King James, Holloman Christian Standard. Then you start getting into the thought for thoughts. Holloman Christian Standard's in between the two. You got the uh, New American Bible, uh, New Revised Standard Version, uh, NIV, and then uh, all the way in between the two, you have mine, the NLT. And you go all the way to the end of paraphrase, and way over there on paraphrase, you got the message. Now, the message is so heavily paraphrased that you need to have another Bible with you if you're going to read that. It's really cool to read and get your point across, but like the Living Bible is paraphrased, um, contemporary English version, good news translation. Uh, but they're all studied very short of the message. They have all been vastly studied and approved. Vastly studied and approved by men and women of God that that's what they do. So next time somebody tells you that your Bible's not inspired, you can go, neither is yours. Unless you are reading a rolled out Torah manuscript from Israel. Four translation myths. Myths of translation number, well, okay, okay, no, no, no. No, I'm glad this is up here. Let me give you a word for word translation real fast in the Greek. I had to read it to you. So this is going to be uh, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I'm going to read it out of the Greek, translate it literally. Ready? Thus for loves the God, the system as besides the son of him, the only generated, he gives that every thee, one blessing into him, no should be being destroyed, but may be having life. How many of y'all got that? <laughs> that is a literal translation of the Greek, word for word. That's why there is no literally perfect translation. It has to be word for word and thought for thought mixed. Uh, 17, for God sent his son into the world to, not to, uh, our, God sent his son uh, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved is not for commissions that God the son of him unto, <laughs> the system that he should be judging, the system but not that may be saving saved, the system through him. So there's not a literal translation. Uh, <laughs> At all, you can't. So, so, so once again, the next time somebody comes to you and says, your Bible's not inspired, neither is yours. But the message is. The message inside of it is inspired all the way. Four translations missed. I think this is my next one, finally. Nope. Do I not have the myths in there? They were, okay. Ah, they were on that side. 
Word for word is the best translation of that. It's a myth. Chapter and verse divisions are inspired. Your chapters and verses are not inspired. Let me explain to you how they got in the Bible. There was a man who decided it would be a lot easier to, to call out context in the Bible in place if we had chapters and numbers. They got so tired of doing it, this is how they started doing it. In a buggy, a horse and buggy system, they were so tired, if the buggy bumped to the left, that was a chapter. If it bumped to the right, it was a verse. <laughs> I'm serious. Oh my God. Time out. Not all of it. But after you get through, you know, about 58 of the 66 books, you get a little tired. So that's why some of those chapters, just those verses start in weird places. The buggy must have bumped. So your chapters and verses aren't inspired, but the word is, the message is. Translations are inspired. That's a myth. No, no the original, the, the message itself, and the gospel message, here's another myth, or the doctrines have been altered through your translations. That's a lie. The message remains the same no matter how, who translated it, when it was translated, what type of translation, word for word, thought for thought, the message is the same. It has not been altered at all. Nobody, nobody hates as hard as people that hate God. And they'll do everything to find something wrong with him. So if you don't think this is the most tested book on the planet, I don't know what else to tell you. Leland Riken. Well, excuse me, yeah. The goal of the Bible translation is to be transparent to the original text, to help us see clearly, as clearly as possible what the biblical authors actually wrote. As of 2020, as of 2020, the Bible has been translated in over 704 different languages. 704. New Testament has been translated into additional 1,551 languages, making it the most translated book in human history. Most tested, most translated book in human history. But there are still 1.5 billion people a day who do not have a full Bible in their language. We think we're close, but we're not. There's still 1,800 languages that need a Bible translation. And this is Wycliffe Bible uh, Alliance and College did this. 1.5 billion people, 1,800 languages still need a translation in their language. Get into the power of Scripture. We're about finished up here. Because Scripture has a divine source, that's why it has the power to transform the dead spirit and make them alive in Christ. Not because man wrote it, but it has a divine source. Understanding that, the purpose of studying Scripture is not about academic exercise. This is the last point. This is the one I need you to get. It's not about academic exercise, but about a life-altering experience. However, the Bible is not a lazy person's book. It requires study, meditation, memorization in order to deeply impact our lives. We should study it, meditate on it, memorize it. Reading scripture without taking the time to meditate on it is like, it's, it, it's like chewing. It's, it's like trying to eat without chewing or swallowing. Just So it's not a lazy person's book. It takes meditation and reading and memorization. And it's not just to show the facts that you can find, but the truth that's held so deeply within. Power of scripture lies in its, in, in its ability to accurately diagnose and describe the condition of humanity and the nature of its problem. That's the power. It describes the human condition. It describes the nature of the human condition and the problem. That's part of the power of Scripture. It illuminates us. It should light up to you. And I don't care if you read, um, you read Ecclesiastes three years ago, read it again. Why? Because God will use it in different seasons of your life in different ways. Nehemiah was one of the books that just jumped out to me. I had read it before and then never really cared about it because it was just Nehemiah. Who knows about Nehemiah? Who cares about Nehemiah? It's just a weird name you get to say. Well, one day reading it, it just hit me in a new way. I've read the gospel storm stories 8,000 times, and one day I needed them in a new way, and they jumped out in a new way while reading them. What happens is the infallibility of Scripture, the inerrancy of Scripture, and the power of Scripture start to come together. Okay? And though it's infallible and no one can really change it, it's also constantly changing for you. 
Meaning what didn't hit you three weeks ago will probably impact your life in a new way. So if you're doing this without reading your Bible, it's why you're still struggling. It's not me. It's not Pastor Chris. It's not, it's not the board. It's not, it's not the youth. It's not, the, it's not me. If you're doing this without actually reading your Bible and you're still struggling heavily with your... That's part of it. This will do more for your life than any amount of preaching or evangelism or anything else. I mean, there's no man of God that you can pay to lay hands on you and scream loud at you to heal you like this can change you. That's just not going to... The Word of God, Hebrews 4.12, is living. It's living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, both joints and marrow, able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. What do you mean? That's why it hits you different, because the Word of God is judging the thoughts and intentions of your heart, and it's, it's alive, and it's coming alive to you and illuminating itself to you in that moment. Next week, we're going to talk about the theology proper, which is the study of God, like big words like omnipotence and omniscience, omnipresent, that you hear all the time that if I ask you to give a definition for you, you go, huh? Because we need to talk about it. We need to understand what that means. We need to understand the why behind the what. I know why we believe in the Bible. I know I believe in the Bible. Now you have something to stand on. Why do you believe? Because it's inerrant. Right? It's infallible. Because the Bible is God's revelation of himself, and it's his word himself. It is inspired and breathed of him. It gets a little deeper as we go. Um, but I appreciate all of you for, for, for starting this with us. I know seven weeks, Wednesday is hard because Wednesday is, is the middle of the work week. Um, but if there's one thing we have an issue with in the body right now, it's uh, biblical illiteracy and theological illiteracy. I cannot tell you the amount of people who are so vastly powerful in the Spirit. Let me explain. They are so anointed in the Spirit and they can sing, they can dance, they can jump, and they can pray. And they, as long as things are good, they are anointed of God and powerful in the Spirit. But they have zero foundation. And the minute they're shook, everything goes away. And they crumble to the ground when they could be shaking the gates of hell. If you ask me what the most needed thing in the, in the church was right now, it would be this. Foundation for people. We're going to feel good on Sunday during worship. We're going to get all hooey, hooey, hooey. Right? We'll get all that. Right? We'll get all that. But we need to know why. Why? Because when problems come into your life, the first thing the enemy does is cast doubt. You've got to know your word. You've got to know why and why you believe. And it's something to stand on more than, than Brother Jojo told you 35 years ago that it's true. No, no, no. I know it to be true for myself. Let's pray and, and we will... Get out of here. Father God, just help illuminate these truths to us that, 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 that we have the, a foundation to stand on, Lord, that we can not, not only use it as apologetics later on, but, but in apologetics in our own lives. When the enemy starts to cast doubt, when troubles come our way, when people start to shake us and rattle us, Lord, whether coffee spills out or tea, we'll still have a solid foundation that we're on. When problems come, we'll know why we believe what we believe and why we stand on what we stand, and we will not be shaken from that. And help us to pass this on. We pass it on in our homes and work and everywhere we go, impacting people with a deeper knowledge of who you are. In Jesus' name.